After three decades as a consultant to the oil industry, Jessica Ernst decided to sue her biggest client, Encana, which is also Canada's largest producer of natural gas. She's also suing the Alberta Energy Regulator and the Alberta government. It concerns fracking, or hydraulic fracturing, where large volumes of water, sand, and chemicals are used to blast open the earth and extract resources, in this case, natural gas. Ms. Ernst alleges fracking has contaminated the aquifer that supplies water to her community and home in Rosebud, about 100 kilometers east of Calgary. And Canna denies her allegations. The anti-fracking movement has been growing over the years due to concerns about its environmental impact. Industry officials have countered with ad campaigns and assurances that fracking is safe. At the same time, they have quietly reached out-of-court settlements with citizens who have sued. Jessica Ernst won't settle. She says she's in it for the long haul until a judge renders a final decision. It's been eight years so far, and the next stop is the Supreme Court of Canada in January. Ms. Ernst is in our Calgary studio this morning, and her lawyer, Murray Klippenstein, joins me in Toronto. Good morning to you both. Good morning, Francine. Hi. Hi. Ms. Ernst, when did the alarm bell first sound for you about your water supply? Well, it took quite a bit of time, Francine. It wasn't an easy thing to figure out. We live in Canada. We think we have perfectly safe, abundant water forever. I started getting incredibly painful caustic burns to my skin, but I didn't know what it was from. It took about, um, oh, eight months before I realized it happened every time I bathed in my water. And in the beginning, my face would burn so badly, I would run to the tap and try to flush the burn away with, of course, my well water, which just made it worse. But it took a while to figure out. It wasn't until one day my two dogs, I poured fresh water for them, and they backed away in revulsion from the water, and it hit me. Uh Uh-oh, it's not me. There's something wrong with the water. They have been fracking, and now I need to find out what has happened here. Until that moment, the the moment the light bulb goes on, uh, you didn't realize that there was fracking going on? No, they said they would never even frack around Rosebud because they said the um, the steep coulee walls and the outcropping of the coals, the gas had long ago left and there would be no coal bed methane and no hydraulic fracturing around us. But they had already for a few years been experimenting. Our little area was the test tube, the beginning of hydraulic fracturing of the sort of new ignorant brute force format And they kept it secret. And I think the reason they kept it secret was because they knew they were contaminating the drinking water. And they also, unfortunately, what I found was the most terrible impact of fracking is they bully and they they shame and they divide and conquer all the communities they want to frack. And they do this by um, bribing with a little bit of money one part of the community. And then anybody who does get harmed, when you try to speak out the community tries to shut you up because they want the money. So do you know that some of your neighbors have had their wells contaminated as well? Yeah, we had about 15 water wells contaminated. The community of Rosebud is on um, two municipal supply wells. They are managed by the county of Wheatland. They are contaminated with methane, ethane, kerosene-based hydrocarbons. Um, There's benzene, toluene, phthalates, and a number of other contaminants. One water well, the Debbie Signer well, had over 52 hydrocarbon contaminants in her well. Let me bring you in, Mr. Klippenstein. Ms. Ernst, your client is not just suing the gas company. She's also suing the government and the energy regulator. Why is that? Jessica uh, gradually came to feel or realize that she'd been let down and often misled by more than just one party. Um, and that the responsibility was wider than than just the company. I mean, the company did what it did, um, and she repeatedly tried to cooperate with the company and then went to the Alberta environment uh, folks, and they did not help, and she went to the energy regulator and uh, similarly. And uh, 
Um, as uh, Jessica found out more and more, she f- came to believe that they were all negligent, uh, badly negligent in carrying out their mandate, legal and political, that they were supposed to protect the environment and protect people like her. So she um, she instructed us to sue them all. And uh, that is a very, very hard road to hoe, but Jessica seems to be making headway. Uh, we got an, uh, a good decision uh, by an Alberta court saying that uh, she would be allowed to sue the government uh, for uh, negligence and that is a pretty hard hurdle to get past but she did it she's she thinks they're all responsible for allowing this kind of underground uh, carnage if you will and why a, an, a, a Toronto lawyer as such as yourself taking on an Alberta case well, Jessica contacted us, and I think she can tell the story, but uh, I think part of it is that uh, I'm not being, uh, you know, unduly critical, but in, in Alberta, I think, because of the, the reach and pervasiveness of the oil and gas industry and the government, there, there's not that many lawyers who aren't in some way um, a little bit compromised if you were going to take a real uh, hard shot at those players. So, uh, And w- we here, we make it part of our mission to try and um, take on cases that hopefully protect the environment. And, and if that um, needs to be in another province, we'll do that. And we're very lucky to have met Jessica. Uh, Ms. Ernst, you never considered taking an uh, Alberta lawyer to defend yourself? Oh, yes, I considered many. I had quite a few conversations. It was heartbreaking, Francine. The lawyers that I approached in Alberta, they, of course, wanted the case, but they did not want to sue the energy regulator or the Alberta government. They told me the regulator could not be sued because of a special immunity clause. They're basically completely legally immune, even for gross negligence acts that they do on purpose. In my case, when I had raised the alarm and started asking questions... They infringed on my charter rights, trying to intimidate me into obedient silence. And I believe that's really important to sue them. In my view, yes, they're all guilty, but the energy regulator is the most most guilty party. So I said to Alberta lawyers, well, but the most guilty party needs to be in this lawsuit. No, we won't touch them. And when I talked about the Alberta government, uh, also extremely important, they are failing completely to protect Alberta's drinking water and families. And they, the lawyers told me they refused to sue the Alberta government because there is no money in it. And I said to them, but I'm not doing my lawsuit for money. I'm doing my lawsuit because a six-year-old cannot speak up for herself when her skin is burned by hydraulically fractured drinking water in her bath. I have to do this lawsuit. And it took me two years. And then I finally realized after a number of betrayals, I had to go out of province. So let me understand this correctly. There is actually two, if not two cases, two issues on the table here. There's a, the environmental issue, the fact that Encana might be poisoning your well water, and there's a freedom of speech issue. Is that right? Yeah, freedom of expression. That's right. They fracked our drinking water aquifers while promising never to do so. And they promised to heed all rules and regulations, but they violated the Water Act. They diverted fresh water from their gas well without a permit. The regulators knew this before I even did, and they worked really hard to cover it up. So there's the cover-up part, there's the failure and the shoddy investigation, and then there's the charter infringement. The charter infringement is your first stop here. You are heading towards the Supreme Court of Canada in January, and, and this, Mr. Klippenstein, is on the freedom of speech issue. Uh, that's correct. As, as Jessica said, she had a number of concerns and complaints uh, against the uh, energy regulator, which, by the way, <laughs> seems to be kind of uh, loaded up with uh, industry tri- types and I think now is actually headed by a former head of the uh, uh, Canadian um, Association of Petroleum Producers, so that's kind of the fox in, in charge of the hen house or whatever you want to call it, I, it seems to me, but I don't know. Uh, so they uh, came down very hard on Jessica when she repeatedly brought these issues to their attention and then began speaking publicly and then said they were shutting her out and wouldn't listen to her anymore. So part of the package of legal actions is a claim that her 
freedom of expression was uh, violated under the charter. And the uh, legal hurdle is that the uh, Alberta government has passed a law, uh, Jessica mentions this, that basically says you can't sue the energy regulator for anything at all, no matter what. But from the way we see it, the uh, charter, which is the constitution, is supposed to be the overriding basic law that governments cannot violate. So it's actually... Um, we think uh, pretty clear that the government should not be allowed to pass a law that says we can break the charter. The first uh, court um, uh, didn't agree with us. The Court of Appeal didn't agree with us, but the Supreme Court of Canada has given um, uh, Jessica leave to argue that case. And I think there'll be interest uh, from across the country because if a province can pass a law that says um, basically we can violate the charter, that's a problem, I think. Jessica is taking on something that is uh, in a way beyond belief, uh, her determination to do this. And now she's taking this this one point all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada and, and uh, on an issue that, uh, you know, is of national importance and other governments are jumping in because they know it. So it took Jessica to do this. Uh, Jessica, you sound pretty convinced that uh, fracking is poisoning your well water, but the Environmental Protection Agency says it's not conclusive and that it's generally safe. Well, that's what they're saying in their press releases and what the media around the world reported. The Environmental Protection Agency of America, their report that just was published, it's a draft report. There's in for review now, and the final will come out next year. They, they actually specified numerous cases where hydraulic fracturing has contaminated drinking water. And to my amazement and stunned shock, they even referenced that Rosebud's drinking water aquifers were directly hydraulically fractured by industry and our water wells contaminated with natural gas. This is the first time a regulator anywhere has actually come out and published that the Rosebud drinking water has been contaminated by hydraulic fracturing. But this is the U.S. regulator. That's right, but the U.S. EPA is probably the biggest one in the world. And there has been no reaction on the part of the Canadian authorities? On of this? course not, no. There's been silence, complete silence. But that doesn't matter. I think silence is a lot easier than the abuse and attacks against me. And the silence to me, I think they're as shocked as I am. And the silence is giving me a lot of confidence. And why are you so determined not to settle out of court? Because this is drinking water. It doesn't belong to any one person, and it does not belong to any corporation in this country. It does not belong to any one entity. It belongs to us. We use it. We need it for life. Wildlife needs it. Livestock needs it. Farms, operations, businesses, tourism, agriculture. The oil and gas industry is not the only industry in the world that makes money. In fact, the fracking industry has been proven over and over to be losing the public money. We're subsidizing it, and it's causing so much damage and increases in cancer, so many health impacts, and so many cases of contaminated water. What's the bottom line from this? It's an extreme form of extraction that's costing more money to get out a little bit, and it's costing more energy to get out a little bit. So... Something has to be done. I don't want to be doing this lawsuit. I would rather be at home and doing my business. My business is, has, is basically ruined. My career is ruined. But nobody, not one person of authority in this country was saying anything. The academic authorities, the Canadian Council of, Cana the, the Council of Canadian Academies, they just basically came out and covered up all the things that the EPA has now said in their report. The academics are not coming forward. They're lying if they do. The few that come out and say things, oh no, there's never been a documented case of fracking contaminated drinking water. It's perfectly safe. And if it isn't perfectly safe, we can make it safe with best practices. Mm -hmm. But industry's best practices are voluntary, unenforceable, and the regulators are looking the other way. It is so bad what they're doing. I have no choice but to go forward. Now, we've offered, of course, uh, to Encana the opportunity to talk about this case, and they declined, uh, but they've sent us a statement in which they say, and I quote, that uh, Encana has been unable to obtain Ms. Ernst's cooperation in order to perform any tests on her property. Encana has always firmly believed that Ms. Ernst's claims are not supported by the facts, and her lawsuit is without merit. Is it true that you haven't allowed the company to perform tests on your property? 
I have a big important part of the data in my lawsuit is a 2003 water well test performed by Encana on my water well. We filed these documents with Encana in our document exchange last year. And the amazing thing about this data is it says water appearance clear. And the tester did not report any visible gas in my water. And then when the government came and tested in 2006, I have now explosive levels of methane. I also have ethane in my water. I have uh, evidence of petroleum hydrocarbons, uh, an alcohol that's not natural. And in Canada, they have come later afterwards and tried to use a whole bunch of different tricks to try to get me to allow them access to my water well. But Francine, if you were witnessing, um, let's say, 10 bank robbers rob the CIBC and the RCMP come along and give all of the sus suspects the keys to the vault to do the fingerprinting. Would you stand by and let that happen? This battle has been dragging on for eight years. Uh, Murray, who's paying the bills? Well, that's obviously a huge issue. Whenever a citizen wants to take on um, some, somebody like in Canada and the government and the environmental regulator, they have basically endless amounts of money, millions and millions of dollars, and endless, endless amounts of lawyers and experts at their disposal to defend it. Someone like Jessica is not in that position, of course. What uh, we talked about when uh, Jessica first contacted us, there's a lot of the difficulties of doing this and some of the financial hardship that it would be uh, for her over the years and years. And uh, she is bearing a huge financial hardship for this. And uh, we on our end, uh, our law firm, our, our core part of uh, our beliefs and our uh, practices and, and business operations is try to minimize legal costs as much as possible in every possible way. Um, which sometimes makes uh, involves making some sacrifices on our side as well to try and um, make this kind of case barely maybe financially possible for somebody like Jessica. So uh, it is, you know, incredible what uh, Jessica is sacrificing financially. Uh, it is costing her some, uh, some legal fees, and we're trying to keep those um, to a, as modest a level as humanly possible. And so how are you managing on your end, Jessica? How is it affecting you, not just financially, but emotionally? Do you have the support of your community, of your neighbors? I am starting to now. I didn't in the beginning because, of course, Encana promised $150,000 to the Rosebud Theater. The promised money works really well. And so many people did try to stop me. Some were very abusive, um, screaming and yelling, saying, we're not going to get this $150,000 if you don't shut up. So shut up. I've had people drive many hours to come and order me to drop the lawsuit because they love the Alberta government so much. Those things are really hard emotionally. The lawyer for Encana, uh, Maureen with Osler, she, Maureen Killeran, she was quoted in the Calgary Herald um, last year, or 2012, saying that in energy law, there's no tears, there's no plaintiffs crying, it's just about money. But I have cried myself to sleep many times. My career meant a lot to me. I haven't had paid work now for years, but I'm working harder than I ever have, but it's helping landowners with the same problems and they can't afford to pay me. I'm selling everything I have. I live extremely frugally. I stay home because driving is expensive. I don't go out as much as possible. And I'm just letting everything go, but realizing in letting everything I have go comes a power that the corporations don't have and the regulator and the government don't have. They have all the money, yes, and they have all the experts and they control the courts, in my opinion. They, they, they've sure managed to delay this out as such a horrifically long time, hoping I would give up or, or run out of money. But they don't have that, that humanness where if you are willing to stand on the line and sacrifice everything, that gives you an enormous power. And I, I rely on that, and that's what keeps me going. And I have to say, <coughs> uh, Francine, that um, Jessica was right in fearing originally that uh, a lot of people would not um, like what she was doing and would want her to shut up, but there's gradually been a, an amazing turnaround. The, the people that come forward, and even when we're in court, you know, Alberta, the courtroom will be packed with people all supporting her and people from the local communities come and will give her a hug and leave food on her porch and 
it's it's amazing they they see her as a hero um and speaking out for little people if you will and uh, you know which is true and and being looked upon as something of a Naren Brockovich does that help you go <laughs> g- <laughs> confront this battle uh, Jessica well, some people have called me that. In fact, the Unanima group, that's how they found me when they asked me to present at the United Nations uh, in 2011, which I was completely surprised by. They didn't even know about the lawsuit because we hadn't gone public yet. But even they realized after my presentation that we're not at all alike. Erin didn't live fracked. She didn't live with contaminated water. It's, it's quite different. We did build cases, so in that way we're similar. And thank you, Marie, for bringing up the communities that have banded around me. The support began internationally. The support in Canada came last. And the support in my community came very last of all. But there were 12 people in the courtroom, one hearing. There were more than that in the Drumheller hearing. And when the food on my deck one day, it was a stormy, horrible, horrible, sort of an ice freezing day. And late at night, my little dog Jam started barking. And I thought, oh, no, don't tell me more people are going to come yelling and screaming at me or... Uh, wanting to abuse me. It was quite late at night, so I didn't answer the door, and and finally I heard a vehicle leaving, and I went to to open the door, and I see taillights go down the country road, down my lane, and I looked down, and there was a bag, and I opened it up, and it was carrots from the farm. And to me, that is more powerful of a donation than any money. Uh, People have donated clothes for court. People have, uh, around the world, when we won our case, and the court allowed me to sue the Alberta government, I had congratulations from around the world, countries that I didn't even know were following the lawsuit. And are you putting any faith, either of you, in the fact that there's been a change of government since you began this battle? The lawsuit's fantastic in many ways, and it's, it's shown me parts of myself I never knew that I, that I had. Because I'm, I'm a really shy person. Doing interviews like this is, is brutal for me. And I go home exhausted for weeks afterwards, just from the stress. But one of the things, the lawsuit, and actually more so the fracking, the lies, like there has just been a new peer-reviewed paper uh, Stanford researchers just came out with. They're admitting now that the companies have also been fracking drinking water aquifers in the States, just like in Canada did here. And and communities have had their water contaminated. This is now in peer-reviewed science, published, just came out this week or sorry, last week. So th- the science is slowly coming out, but my hope has been killed. I've had so many people promise so many things and then turn around and not just stab it back into me, but take 20 sabers and rip it around in my back. I don't trust anybody anymore except my lawyers and one or two journalists. Um, I... I... I don't expect anything from the new Alberta government, and I don't expect anything because what, they've inherited this lawsuit. They didn't cause these damages. They didn't violate my charter rights. They didn't pass the law to give this regulator such an obscene immunity clause, and they didn't allow in Canada to, to experiment in secret while lying. And it's not their fault now that they have this lawsuit because I'm, I'm suing the government. I would hope that they will step forward and intervene on the behalf of all Albertans to the Supreme Court and say, yes, we are going to intervene uh, in this hearing at the Supreme Court in January because all Albertans' charter rights trump the Alberta Energy Regulator. But I don't know if they have the courage. But, but a victory, Murray, in front of the Supreme Court would change everything completely, wouldn't it? Well, yes and no. I mean, I, I see this as a long, hard road and a victory. I mean, Jessica's already won several times. I'm pretty confident she'll win at the Supreme Court, but forces and institutions and prejudice that she's taken on is so big that one victory at the Supreme Court won't won't change a whole lot. It'll change something, but, you know, people need to see that she's marching through the system and her... 
her her uh, story and the facts are always the same. And as Jessica said, she's been right all along. Now, gradually, the powers that be, the institutions, the people in the places of comfort are finally admitting what everyone should have recognized long ago, that this fracking and contamination is going on all the time. That, you know, when the industry people say there's never been a proven uh, case, it's because they've used their brutal power of money to silence people into secrecy and buy them off and force them to shut up. That's why there's no public cases, you know. And also, if even if you do win uh, in front of the Supreme Court in January, you still have to go back to Alberta yeah. and win that case, the yeah. environmental case. Yeah. Is yeah. that right? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, that explains partly why there's uh, so little public accountability of the fracking companies. They can cause wreckage and carnage everywhere. They have so many lawyers and so much money, they can just paper it all over, shut everybody up, and then on they roll, you know. That's actually the main reason why I will not gag and settle. And uh, there's more to it, too. I had I have my own incorporation, which, of course, doesn't get work anymore. But as a scientist, I'm a Canadian scientist, and it is my business and my scientist due diligence to do what I'm doing and get the data on the record in court. If we win at the Supreme Court, I also feel quite confident there, although there's that um, little disclaimer I keep at the back of my brain. What I've learned so far in the court system in Canada or the legal system, is that there are court rules, and then there are court rules for the oil and gas industry. They seem to get away with whatever they want to get away with, and it, it makes the legal process brutally difficult. If I win at the Supreme Court, I come back to the very same judge in the very same court that said, no, your charter rights mean nothing here. The AER trumps your charter rights. Am I going to get anywhere in the Alberta courts? I don't think so. So then how many more times will the energy regulator, what tricks have they got up their sleeve for next time? Uh, will this take 20 years? I don't know, but whatever I'll do, I'll just keep going. The fact that Rachel Notley has said that she thinks the energy regulator is a, in a bit of a conflict of interest, she's going to look into that. Does that give you any kind of hope? Well, it, again, my hope has been killed. I mean, not only is Gerard Prati, was he the creator and the chairman of CAP, which is the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, big oil and gas lobby group in Canada, but he was the ex-VP of Incana, and he's now in charge of the en a very energy regulator that I'm suing. I think uh, Alison Redford put him into position because of my lawsuit. And the other terrible thing that's been happening, the regulator has been allowing in Canada to continue to frack in the freshwater zones within 400 meters of my water well. That's absolute madness. So will the NDP government of Alberta, will they, I think they want to look at the regulator and they want to get rid of the corruption and the conflict of interest, but they'd probably have to fire 90% of the people. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's, I don't know what they're going to do. Can they? Will, will, does Prati have, uh, uh, did Redford give him a five-year contract? I would imagine we'll have to pay him a whole bunch of money if uh, the government tries to get him removed from being chair of the regulator. They have a really big job ahead of them. I'm willing to help them in any way they need. I've said this once on the radio before. If the Alberta environment shredded all the documents in relation to my case after the election, I have copies of all in Canada's well data. So if they need help, I'm willing to give them the data. Sounds like this has a few more years of battling ahead. Thank you very much, both of you, and, and good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Francine. Jessica Ernst was in our Calgary studio. She is an oil industry consultant who is fighting a landmark legal case over fracking in Rosebud, Alberta. Murray Klippenstein is her lawyer. He was with me in Toronto. As I mentioned during the interview, we invited Encana to speak with us, and they declined. We extended the same invitation to the Alberta Energy Regulator, which declined to comment on the grounds that this matter is before the courts. The government of Alberta replied to say the justice minister is considering whether to intervene in the Supreme Court hearing in January.